Hello, and welcome to Somewhat Damaged. Joining John and I today, Brian Volkweiss, who's here to tell us all about the brand new History Channel Star Trek project you put together called The Center Seat, 55 Years of Star Trek. We're going to talk about that and, of course, all the amazing comedy he's produced over the last couple of years. Sit back, relax, get ready. I was just telling John, I'm like, when Brian signs on, he's going to probably be in his home office, which is like sitting in a toy shop warehouse. I was waiting for the FAO Swartz background, but what do I, I mean, I got Sarah Silverman in the background now. I mean, it's fine. It's fine. By the, by the way, Greg, you just, I don't think you realize that you just said the funniest fucking thing, definitely in a week, maybe in a month. What? I what? love it. I was all happy and excited. You were like, it's like he's in a toy shop. But then you added warehouse. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, I, you're right. No, that's accurate. That's accurate. It, but it, I mean, it's, I was really telling John, like, you got to see this. It's like, it's nothing but figurines behind him. And it's like amazing. And then we started talking about TMNT and a debate on when TMNT actually started, which you could certainly clear up. What year did Ninja Turtles start? Oh, geez, I'm terrible with years. And I have, uh, I have like a good high school education in Turtles, not, <laughs> not, not even a bachelor's. I, I think it was 83 or 84. So my favorite thing in the world is for some reason, uh, Kevin Eastman now is telling people at conventions uh, that I lied and uh, said I reunited them uh, for the first time, which I never said because I know we didn't do that. Right. Um, and you can watch the episode. We never said it. Sure. Um, but yeah, so now I literally every couple months I get DMs from people being like, dude, I was just at so and so in Oklahoma. Kevin, well, like, <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this is how sick fuck I am. I'm like, Kevin Eastman knows my name. <laughs> okay. They That's should a compliment. Kept, they should have kept the franchise. I'm sure okay. they um, hey man, so how you doing? How's everything? How's the family? How's life on the West Coast? It's all good. The family's great. We're uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, we're all starting to pull out of COVID. Like I said, this is my second day in a row in the office. I was leaving the house. My daughter's like, oh, daddy, are you starting to go to work again every day? <laughs> and it's like, so the good news is, like, I'm so happy to be back in the office. The bad news is, like, you know, it was, uh, it was good to be with the family that much. Yeah, right. And, I mean, it's, it's not like you've done anything in the last year and a half to keep yourself busy while at home. We did not slow down, <laughs> which is amazing. <laughs> which is amazing. I started. I, I just. I just like. I always do. I went on to IMDb to just like look up to make sure I was up to date with everything. And I'm like, this is insane. Like, first of all, there's no chance you slept. And how many people are working on? It's just unbelievable amount of content you guys have put out in the last. You know, since this all started happening, and and it's not very even. Fun. Very, very lucky. Yeah, I mean, and it's great content. And, you know, we've had a bunch of people on in the comedy world who've, who've you've done specials with. We just had Sam Talon on. We had on um, uh, Chris Gethard a while ago. I love Chris. Oh, and, my God. You know, the specials are super cool. And, you know, I'm, I, and John, I'm sorry for rambling, but. No. When, when it came to acquiring all of this, did you just, like, how did you pick the stuff you were going to acquire to release that you guys didn't produce? Oh, I mean, it's entirely based on the quality. I mean, I, with Chris Gethard, it's funny. It's a really funny story. So I was aware that he had shot a special right. and I had been talking to his agent and manager and, you know, I was kind of dancing around. Like, I always loved Chris and I loved the video, but I was just kind of dancing around it. Then I saw the greatest documentary that has come out in, I think, 10 years, uh, which was called... Um, Oh, I forget the actual name, but it was like Lost. That good. It was that good, huh, Brian? <laughs> it was. I told you I'm terrible at names, but fair enough. Um, but um, Class Action Park. Oh, yeah. That That is honestly, I grew up there. Yeah. So I, we had that. That was our whole conversation last time we had your son. Yeah. So I saw that doc and I literally like I saw the doc on a Sunday 
right? Monday morning, my first call was to his manager. And I'm like, I need this. I like, I, it got, cause I love the doc. Like I said, my favorite doc in probably 10 years. Um, Chris was the best part of the doc. Right. So yeah. So that's just one example, but that's a, that's a, that's an unusual case. Most of the time, like we'll get, like, we get it every day. I got a, a text from Eric Griffin last week with a special he produced for someone else. And I watched 20 minutes of it, loved it. Our acquisitions team watched it. They loved it. And we're going to try and see if we can acquire it. Oh, that's and, awesome. But many times that'll happen. And we're like, bring us your next one. Right. I mean, I can, I mean, obviously, you know, I imagine that everybody is sending you DMs. Hey, I'm shooting a special at Ha Ha's. You know, you want it? <laughs> they, um, for better or worse, that does happen daily. But this is what I always say. And again, I don't know if you noticed or not, I was a manager for 10 years. Yeah, of, of course. Comedians. Sure. So I'm saying this as a producer, but I'm always, I'm also saying it as a former manager. It may not feel like we're doing you a favor by passing, right? but we are doing you because that cliched saying you can never redo a first impression. Yep. That is not, I mean, it's cliched because it's fucking true. Right. Right. Oh so, yeah. So that in addition to the fact that we're very quality conscious, um, we also, a comedian does not want to put a special out prematurely. Sure. It's, well, let's, can, can we talk about that a little bit, uh, Brian? Uh, specifically, you know, the idea, I mean, you were in the, com you, you, were, you, you were a comedy manager, you know, we hear all these things about um, industry and like these industry rooms and, you know, what I really actually, the heart of it is, is there a defined way that you can become famous as a comedian? I, I've been doing this 23 years and this is what I can tell you. 99% of people, if they stick with it for seven years, 99, maybe not 99%, but uh, 90, 98% should be able after seven years to make a living. Now it might not be a great living, but they don't need to bust tables or have a day job. Of the 2%, and like I said, 2% will just never make it. But if you're at the seven year mark and you're selling, let's say 300 tickets a night, if by the time you get to the 10 year mark, you're really not selling at least three or four times that, then yeah, I, I, I would do some serious introspection. But the problem is there's a lot of examples of people, Bill Burr. I mean, Bill Burr, I think, I think Bill Burr was, you know, started doing comedy in his late teens. You know, he didn't break out until I think he was in his mid to late thirties. Like then that's Bill Burr, somebody I consider to be one of the greatest comedians in history. Right. So you just, you never know. You never know. So the key is just not to give up. What, what do you think about, you know, it, now the formulas have all changed in, you know, putting out any type of specials, but, you know, especially comedy or, you know, and in music, of course, where people are, are sort of avoiding the distribution networks and, and um, you know, companies like you guys and ATC, you know, these are, you know, other ones and are doing it direct to like YouTube themselves. Do you, th what do you think about that model? I mean, it's hard to answer the question and be taken seriously because I have tremendous bias. Of course. But if you trust me to give you an honest answer, despite my bias, it, it I think, listen, I think if your name's Kevin Hart, it, it's a great plan. Right. But he, like, here, here's the, anytime I get asked this question, this is always, and I get asked this question a lot by comedians. I'm sure, I'm sure. And this is always my answer. And I know it's not the greatest example, but uh, if people remember, there was a time before Louis C.K. was Me too yep. uh, He was one of the biggest comedians ever. And he literally did all this press, all this media, jumping up and down, saying how he was going to release it on his website to his fans. And he did, 
and he, it was this big PR thing and it was this huge story and everybody was scared and everybody was worried. Right. Do you, every, and everybody in the comedy business remembers this. Sure. Here's what most people forget or don't, didn't even notice at the time. Guess where Louie did his next special? With you. HBO. <laughs> Guess where Louie did the special after that? Netflix. And after that, Netflix. So here's the guy who's the poster child for do it yourself. Right. <laughs> I mean, the same could be saying of like uh, somebody like um, uh, Andrew Schultz. I mean, Andrew was so on this tirade about specifically Netflix. And then all of a sudden during the pandemic, what's he do? He goes to Netflix and he does his special over there. And I heard there's another one come uh, You know, he, he doing some other things as well. Um, we did the think, other thing. Yeah, I think Brian can talk to you about the other thing. Yeah, we did the other thing. <laughs> but it, it's, here's the thing. It, it's all about, listen, I, I built all this from scratch. So, of course, I respect anybody trying to build something from scratch. So a comedian who wants to do it their way on their terms. I'd be the biggest hypocrite in the world if I didn't support that. Right. right. And no, by the way, I'm okay being a lot of things. A hypocrite uh, is not one of them. Yeah, no, totally. I, I'm just curious because, you know, there's been, you know, a couple, you know, obviously Louis, but you know, even like Mark Norman, super successful doing it on, you know, on his own. I'm, I'm always just curious. Cause you know, I don't, I just like hearing. But, but, but hold on, Greg. You say he's super successful doing it on his own. How are you defining success? Oh, no, no. I, I don't. I mean, yeah. he, 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 well, so I talked to Mark about it. So he looks at it as it was successful. But I think it's also, you have to look at that in the capsule because he did, like, from what I understand, and you probably know way more than me, he didn't have, like, it was turned down in every, you know, I'm sure you, you know, with you guys and I know Netflix and some of the other streaming services didn't take it and he wanted to put it out so he did and i think he's gauging the success on views and you know whatever income he's derived from it but you know of course it's not like selling it to netflix or in a distribution network like your guy i i didn't even mean it like that and by the way to the best of my knowledge we did not pass on that i, I don't think i would have i love him right i don't think it was brought to us but i could be wrong i could be where i always forget we're not a 10 person company anymore so right. i it, i could be wrong but it, if I'm a comedian at his level, right. I would determine success as t t ticket sales while on the road going up. Sure. Andrew Schultz is a great example. If he, he did all this YouTube shit and then he would, you know, be in Oklahoma a year later and the prior year, let's say he sold 5,000 tickets this year, he sold 15,000 tickets. That's success. 100%. Sure. So if Mark is experiencing that, I agree. Right. I don't know. Well, we'll just look at Polestar numbers in a couple of weeks. I mean, that's really what we'll do, actually, at that point. Um, but, you know, I, I got to ask the question, Brian. Um, is there something that you've passed on that you were like, fuck? One. In one. my entire career, one. Really? Joe Coy. Ha! Hell yeah, Filipinos. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I don't, I don't want to say why I fucked up because it would throw somebody under the bus, sure. but it, it wasn't because of Joe. Like I knew Joe was great. I wanted to do it, but there, the way it came to me, that's why I passed. And I, 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 I have not made that mistake again, but in all the passing that I've done, that that's the only time I passed on anything where I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the stuff that you have coming out and out and done in the last several years. I mean, you, you obviously have very good instincts. <laughs> So you're very, uh, you're very kind. So let, let's kind of pivot from comedy for a second and talk about TV, right? So you have the Star Trek thing that's out, right? That, that's what I should have called it. I should have called it the Star, the Star Trek, Trek thing. thing. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Been working on it for fucking three years, but we'll just call it the thing, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I might, I, might, I might change the name to that. The Star Trek thing. I like that. That's, that's the, that's the extra DVD when people buy, start buying DVDs. Right. So, I mean, I know that that's obviously a project 
that is, you know, very near to you because you're a huge Star Trek fan. It's like saying the ocean's wet. Yes, I know. Um, what, like, how do you do that project being so incredibly close to it? And as a fan, it wasn't easy, man. It wasn't <laughs> easy. Like, Gates was worried at one point I would show up to an interview in a, in a Starfleet uniform. <laughs> I, I, had, uh, I had to be like, Gates, first of all, you may not believe me, but on a scale of one to 10, a Star Trek fandom, I'm only in my mind, a 7.5. And part of the reason I'm not even an eight is I never dress up. So rest, rest assured. But no, it, I mean, listen, you know, I interviewed Nicholas Meyer and, uh, at the end, I, you know, I behaved. Right. At the end of the interview, after we were done, you know, I said to him, I go, hey, man, like, you know, I just got to tell you the words you wrote in Star Trek II, I don't believe in the no-win scenario. That's in my will to be inscribed on my tombstone. And then I started explaining to him the impact those words had had on my life. And I just started bawling. Wow. I mean, fucking my collar's wet from tears and I'm all embarrassed. And then I look up, dude, he's crying too. <laughs> so then I'm like real embarrassed. It's like getting awkward and weird. Right. And as I'm walking out, like, I don't need, I can't, I'm like too embarrassed to look anybody in the eye, but I look up, dude, half the crew was tearing up too. <laughs> like it was, it was really, so there's that kind of shit. Sure. And then, you know, I interviewed Kirstie Alley one of the greatest interviews of my career. I mean, I will never look at Star Trek II the same way, a film I've seen at least 300 times. Right. So yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. I mean, it was, it, was, it was pretty wild. So when you, like now it's done and it's out there, are, are you now watching it as a fan, like critiquing it, even though you made it? Like, I imagine that obviously went a lot into it when you were making it, but now that it's done, are you like, in your fan head critiquing this, this series as if you were not involved? Um, so I always do the same thing. I, I watch the first episode at home and that's really it. Right. Like I'm not, I'm one of these people where like, it's weird because so much of my personality and my business is nostalgia based, yep. but I'm not really a backwards looking guy. So like the minute it's out, you're on. Just The reason I watch one episode at home is like, I never want to lose respect for how difficult this business is and to not celebrate the fact that we had an idea and now it's on television screens. You got to show respect for that by watching one episode. Sure. But more than one episode, it's like, I don't know. It's like, it's starting to border on like, I think narcissism. <laughs> like, I just don't, yeah, I just don't do it. Right. What what's the reaction from the fans been like the super fans? I, I, I have seen one bad anything. And right. it was the only thing it said was they hated the music. <laughs> like, that's it. So I would say I've conservatively seen two or three thousand comments or reviews. Right. And it was the only bad one. Wow. I, I haven't seen anything like it since season one of Toys and Made Us. Right. That's awesome. I mean, congratulations. It's, you know, I, I, I can't imagine being involved in a project that that's that close to, to home, right? You're listening to another episode of the Somewhat Damaged Podcast, part of the Storic Media Podcast Network and brought to you by Corona Premiere, now available on draft. So to, be a part, to be a part of that fandom, um, you know, like uh, for, for Star Trek, you know, there's 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 very there's there's differing uh, you know opinions on it. Uh, obviously, the one thing that uh, pops in my mind is Shatner on the SNL sketch, kind of uh, chastising uh, people at the at the convention. Um, what do you what do you say to some of those that are like, uh, it's just a show? You know, you've 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 made a, you've made a career so far of things you know of the toys and movies that we grew up with. What do you say to some of those? Uh, people that say you know what it was just a part of my life but like there's no need to do a whole kind of series about this you know john i could be wrong but i i, I don't think there's people saying that anymore like i think that that for me the bcad moment of geekdom 
as far as I can tell, and this is looking backwards, I didn't notice it right away, was Iron Man. Something about Iron Man and what Marvel's done. First of all, I mean, one of the main things Marvel's done is it's brought in women. Yeah. I mean, I, I will never forget, I was in a vintage toy store in Chicago probably six or seven years ago, and I'm in there, and I suddenly noticed there were all these women in the store and I was like, what's going on? Like, like, what, what, is there a special thing today for something like, and that was the beginning of me noticing how things had changed. Then I would see a girl, like a normal looking girl, like the kind of girl that would beat me up when I was a kid for talking <laughs> about Star Trek. I would see a normal looking girl, not even walking down the street wearing a Princess Leia or a Han Solo shirt. She'd be wearing like a fucking, Ugnot shirt or like a, like some peripheral like mace window and you're like when did that happen like, and that's so to your question john i i mean i haven't i've really i haven't been asked that in probably 10 years about. it's interesting because I, I i asked that question because obviously you know with the inceptions of like the the marvel universe and comic con it seems like fandom and you know you know nerdum of, uh, of projects such as like, I mean, listen, I'm a huge Ghostbusters fan. I'm a huge WWE fan, but I always sometimes see these detractors and maybe they're just trolls, but I'll be looking through. Oh, uh, hold, on, hold on, John, WWE, that's, that's a whole other planet. <laughs> right. so they, I mean, literally that is the, of every episode, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just don't want to forget sure. the title this. Of every episode we have made, of every series we have done, starting with Toys That Made Us, they're all, everything's interconnected and then wrestling's over here. Yeah. Like that, that company, that fandom. Yeah. <laughs> Here's what I can guarantee you. I will never do anything else ever again with that covers, remotely touches. The, the, there was this fucking wrestler Oh my fucking God. Like we shot in his house. It couldn't have gone better. Like, again, we shoot in the Smithsonian. We shoot in LACMA. It, like, it, like we shoot in the most prestigious places ever. We did, we shot, we left. The guy is still trolling me for fucking up his collection. His fans are trolling me. Like I'll post a picture of like my fucking family at Disneyland. And people years later will be like, yeah, but you fucked up so-and-so's collection. Why are you following me? Like, <laughs> I'm at Disneyland with my kids. Like, please. Oh, my so, God. WWE, you win. We're out. <laughs> like, you fucking go with God. But have sorry, you, God, you, you, you say. Have you... Speaking of WWE, because I, you know, we, I'm in a related business that's totally reliant on fandom, geekdom, nerddom, all of that stuff, as you know. So, like, have you ever been to a WrestleMania when you were doing that, or in your lifetime, have you been to one? No. no. <laughs> it hurts so much for Brian. He's like, no, I don't know what I, I, I have no judgment for anybody's fandom. Like, right. as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, sure. I respect it. And I'm curious about it. There's a bunch of shit that I'm not into that everybody else is into. Mafia shit. Right. Like, you, you gun to my head, I won't watch another hour, another minute of Sopranos. Dinosaurs. <laughs> don't give a fuck about dinosaurs. Never right. have. <laughs> and wrestling. Right. Like, I have literally, like, all growing up, half my friends were like, and I'm literally like, what is this? <laughs> Now, keep in mind, they were looking at me being like, yo, what's up with your Star Trek fetish? Yeah, right. So right. Everybody's got their own weird shit. Yeah. But I, my, yeah, wrestling, that's, that's all you. So I'll, I'll tell you what I <laughs> because I've, I've been to several WrestleManias, right? I bet it's great. And well, several, several. Okay. All right. Relax you. <laughs> well, no, I mean, business related. So I, I, all I can tell you is, I think that everyone in their lifetime should go to a WrestleMania. I, I would I would go once. Just yeah. to see it because it really is, especially guys that are, you know, uh, you know, obsessed with the fandoms and, and all of that stuff to really 
see it because that's why I went. And it is several different layers above anything else in insanity than any of the, you know, Star Wars conventions, Star Trek conventions, Kiss conventions. It, it really is its own unique animal. I, I, I would be curious to go watch. I mean, I've been to the Super Bowl once. Yeah. I've been to a World Series game once. Like, so I love doing, I love experiencing stuff like that once. But, yeah. So I would do WrestleMania. And you know what? I bet you I would enjoy it if I were there. Yeah, you probably would. I'll tell you where you got to go if you really want to double, double down on the experience. <laughs> <laughs> is WrestleMania in Orlando, Florida, Tampa, but Orlando. Okay. Like, I'll even give it to you even better than that. If you want to see like total, what I like to call what we in the, what in our fandom called like marks, you need to go to those high school like shows where it is wrestlers from six, seven years ago. And there's charging $20 a pop for pictures in this old decrepit uniform. And their, <laughs> their, their broid bellies are popping out. I'm going to get into a lot of trouble by fucking saying this. <laughs> I know this right now, but yeah, that's, you see like the true, like the true fan, but I wanted to kind of go back to Brian, you know, like where do you, where do you have your most fun? Do you have your most fun at like, events that are kind of well catered to let's say let's say the creation guys they do like the star trek uh uh, uh conventions or do you like the ones that are kind of like smaller toy shows like uh that that kind of just travel the east coast or the west coast where do you find the best fans i mean wait the best fans or the best or the best stuff i mean what where do you have the most fun I'll be honest with you, man. I just like going to antique stores and flea markets. Really? Like, yeah, because I I kind of like, you know, it's weird. It's it's. I'll give you a great example. This just happened to me. I was at New York Comic Con, and I can't explain it to you. Maybe you can explain it to me. Um, what's the name of the assassin from Clone Wars with the big antenna sticking out of her head? Um, I didn't watch Star Wars, actually. Well, there's a there's a Star Wars character. Uh, she's got a big fucking 20 foot antenna sticking out of her head. And they made a black series version of her. And I'm, I've been looking for it. I, I've, I've been looking for it for, for weeks. At the time I was at, Toy Fair, at, at New York Comic Con, like literally for almost a month, I was looking for that figure. I remember distinctly walking through the seller's floor seeing her and not buying her and keep walking. And then the next week I'm home and a buddy of mine is at a bizarrely enough Macy's and he sees a bunch of toys there and he takes a picture and I see her right. and I'm like, Oh my God, Oh my God, get her, get her, get her. Like the reason I tell you that story is to make the point. There is something to me that's a bit overwhelming about having this giant space like the fucking entire javits center full of vintage toys like where it just like i'm kind of like i can't compute i can't compute and i still bought tons of shit don't get me wrong but when i go to an antique store or a flea market i'm hunting for toy stuff and then there'll be like one vendor out of 30 and I'll be like, oh shit, that's great. Oh shit, that's great. Then I'll find another vendor out of 20. Like that's, to answer your question, that's my favorite thing to do. Right. Is Have there you... one piece in particular that you're looking for to kind of complete the collection? Is there anything, is there a holy grail for you? There, there's two things I want that once I get them, it'll kind of be the end. Like there's always little shit I find out about every now and like yesterday, I just found out, I didn't even notice there's a Saturn V GoBot. <laughs> so like now I'm obsessed with getting a Saturn V GoBot. So there's always new stuff entering my crazy brain. But the two things that never leave my crazy brain, one is Vlix, the most obscure uh, production Star Wars character ever, was only sold in Brazil. By the way, fun fact, when Toys That Made Us came out, they were going for 30 grand. Uh, now they're going for almost a quarter million dollars. Whoa. So, yeah. uh, so that's one. And obviously there's, I have an excuse that I don't have one. It's a shitty one is 80 grand now. Um, and then the other thing I really want is Mego made this bonkers 
Star Trek One Bridge. And that that I kind of don't have an excuse that I don't have. <laughs> it, that's have it. You, like, that's you, really it. Have you been to that like collectible antique flea market in um, City of Industry? Sure. Yeah, sure. I, I've gone to that a few times, and that's a pretty cool place. Well, to it's fun as Frank and Sons. Um, yeah, I, so. um, I before COVID, I had a rule: I would only go once a year. Right. I would bring a thousand dollars cash, and I would leave my credit cards at home. <laughs> it's a good rule. Yeah, but it's changed a lot. I've heard so yeah. it's because I've heard it's shifted to be way more modern right. than it was before COVID. Sure. I, I mean, I haven't been there obviously since before COVID, but I like to always like going to that place because, you know, you see a lot of new stuff, but it's a good hunt. You know, it's a good By hunt. Way, my favorite memory of Frank and Sons. I'm there with my firstborn son uh, and he was like six months old and I'm walking around, walking around this little girl. I mean, she was probably six years old. This little girl comes up to me and she's like, excuse me, sir, your son is asleep. <laughs> and I look, he's like this, uh, like and I hadn't even noticed. I'm literally <laughs> walking around with this like, like, like baby. Like, ah. If anything shows you my uh, my my appreciation for Frank and Sons, uh, that would be it. Yeah, it's a cool place, John. If you haven't, if you if you don't know it, next time we're in LA, we'll, we can if we're there on a Wednesday, we can swing by. It is an enormous, enormous like it's two full size warehouses, yeah. and they tore the wall down in between them. And it's just like collectible toys and figurines. Yeah. And wow really and it you it's, know it's, it's open saturdays too not just when they oh it is only i didn't yeah. know them. i've only been yeah. yeah but it's awesome so what like what's the is i mean I'm, you're not going to divulge it on our podcast what the next series is but is there other stuff you're looking to do besides yeah. well we're not looking to do it we're doing it so okay. we have uh we have a bunch of stuff in production now that i hope people will be excited about when we announce it do you like what I've gotten into in the last since the, the COVID stuff happened, like a ton of people did, and I, I think it ruined the market. I'm curious what your take is on the trading card world, right? Like I, you know, like all, all kids, I traded, I, I was big into collectible trading cards and baseball cards and flipping and all that crap and then got back into it in my 20s, then put it away. And now through my teenage kids, I got sort of back into it. And now I'm like full fledged back into it. And you know, the market ha has taken such a dramatic uptick because of everyone being at home, you know, or whatever the reasons you want to say. And it seems like it's now not even close to being a hobby. It's a business. I mean, I would say it's both. Right. But I mean, dude, prices on all this shit. I mean, I was in a store in uh, Cincinnati. No, sorry. Actually, those were very fair. Those were ridiculously fair prices sorry um i was in a store in minneapolis about a month ago like i mean his prices are nuts crazy I mean, like they had these batman the animated series loose figures right that like i mean i've been sitting on my shelf covered in dust like they're going for like 80 bucks a piece yeah like yeah it's it's me a hundred thousand copies of that why would that be 80 dollars <laughs> it's it's wild like i you know i'm mostly into the you know sports and um cards and stuff like that as my kids are but i started looking back towards some of the old marvel trading cards that were out in the early 90s like 92 93 there yeah was marvel i had some of those yeah and i i i bought a couple and one of them i bought purely by mistake or did not by mistake i bought it on purpose but i didn't realize what i was buying and it happens to be like a super rare um first um spider-man amazing fantasy card that i i i looked at it and i'm like that can't possibly be and it's like several hundred dollars because it has a tiny different mark on it or something and i'm like that's insane but it's not even the collectible values of the the older cards it's what these new cards are going for like to walk in buy a brand new 2021 box of nba cards and it's six hundred dollars. You're, you're talking to the wrong guy. Like, yeah, no, I know, I know. <laughs> what, what should it be? Like, I, I couldn't even tell you. Like, what what price would you not raise your eyebrows about? Oh my God! I mean, well, I, it's it's not about what the box costs. So, 
and I'm sure you would be crazy intrigued by this because, you know, when you were younger, whether you bought baseball cards or Ninja Turtle cards or Star Wars cards or Elvis cards, and you bought a pack, you'd buy a pack for like 25 cents, 50 cents. You know, if you look back on the old boxes from the 80s, they're marked 50 cents a pack, whatever. You cannot go into a trading card store today and buy a pack of cards for probably less than five dollars. And that pack of cards is absolute garbage, right? You won't find anything of value in there. The rookie cards are worthless. To start buying packs that have stuff that's of value, you're talking like $20 a pack of cards. That's like five cards, you know, eight cards. It's, it's insane. And like, you know, you would used to walk into Target and, you know, where the Pokemon and Magic the Gathering and all those cards are, they would sell boxes of cards for $19, right? But it had like eight packs in there. Now resellers are selling that stuff for like a hundred dollars. It's crazy. crazy. It's insane. Crazy. Did, what, have you bought any of the Star Wars cards that came out this year by Tops? I, I'm not a car guy, oh. so I I I have to be. I have an addictive personality, so I need to be very careful yeah. about, about. One of my rules is uh, no paper goods. Right. So because hmm. like as crazy as my collection is, and it's crazy. I mean, it's it's. I mean, it's probably closer to 3,000 pieces now than even 2,500. Um, but uh, I, need, I, need, I need rules. I need guardrails. And I apologize. I, I got to jump here in a second or two. Yeah. I didn't realize what time it was. Sorry. Sure. It's okay. So, all right. So we could, we could um, wrap. And we always wrap. And I'll let John ask you the question. Then you can run and you know, yell at the answer and then run. Uh, right. John, end how we usually end. And then I'll, I'll catch up with you later, Brian. So, Brian, what we always try to uh, close with is obviously, you know, you've been kind of stuck at your house, but we, you know, with the world reopening, um, we want to know what the best thing you ate this week was. You know, it's a Tuesday morning, right? (laughs) Yeah. So give me a seven day span from Tuesday to last Tuesday. All right. All right. Um, Oh, I just missed it. If this was Monday, I'd be able to say Waffle House. Oh, dope. You went to a wall. Where? Wait, where? You're in when I was in Cincinnati. Uh, oh, but that was shit. eight days ago. That was eight. That's days. okay. That's okay. Do you have a do you have a do you have something that you eat uh, on the Waffle House menu? That's like what it's yours? called, but it's like they should call it one of everything. It's like ah. waffle, eggs, grits. It's like the all American or something like yes. that. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah, yeah. All American. <laughs> There's All something right. about Waffle Houses, man. I'll I tell will. you that much. All right, Brian. Well, thanks, buddy. Thank you, Greg. John, this was fun to be Absolutely, man. Yeah, I'll see you soon. Absolutely. Bye, guys. See ya. Bye. See ya.